So it must have been God, right? Amen. So we'll give a few minutes as it gets uh, rare right on the screen. Um, but but the boat here represents our comfort zone. The disciples had the same chance, the same opportunity to step out and walk with Jesus no more. But they wanted to what? Play safe. Amen. Understand this. You will never accomplish God's will for your life if you never step out of the boat. See, this picture right here is so powerful because it, it, it shows you that Peter's like, God, you say he come to you, he got out of the boat. Don't knock him because he gets a scene. You would have stayed in the boat too. <laughs> you would have been like, like nah, I'm Charlie, dude, I'm a Nah, that's not that's not right. That's not normal. I'm not saying I know where I I know where I stand. I know where my place is. Distraction there, right? But the fact that Peter stepped out, that is the message. That is the miracle that Peter got out. Amen. And like I said, you, you will never accomplish God's will for your life if you never step out of the boat. Go all in for God. See, I always preach another message to go all in. Right? Like the corporate prayer, when they go all in, they put all the chips in. I, I have nothing to go back on. Right? And I was going to preach that about that guy that no. You preach on getting out of the comfort zone. Let me ask you your homeboys, homegirls a question. Is the home comfortable? No. You, you're uh, walking on water. You're like Peter. You stepped out of your comfort life. You stepped into an ocean. <laughs> Amen? But let me say this, though. It, it, it's not forever. For me, it is. Yeah, I'm still stuck at home. For 20, uh, for, uh, I almost forgot how, how old I am. <laughs> for over 30 years, they didn't say that. And then, for people like me and Martin, you know, happy, you know, we're stuck in this place. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. And, and it may not be this home, but it'll be a home somewhere. You, you, you may still be the home. Amen. But understand that God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. God wants to do something through you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. It says plans for welfare, not for to be on welfare, all right? but for welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. See, God says, I know what I have for you. I got it all written out for you. Just like uh, my, my, my father has, has these blueprints for a house that he's been wanting to build for the past 20 years. He has the plans. He has everything. Like, this, this is what I want. It's like God says, I got the plans for you. We well, you got to do the work. You got to dig the foundation. You got to start, you know, doing the hard work to build that house. And it's like, God said, I know the plans I have for you. But you have to step out of the boat to get to where you want to go. If you want to fulfill your calling in life, you need to take a step outside of the boat of your comfort zone. You got to step out. For, for me, I had to step out and go to the home of San Antonio. The, the boat here, was, it was too comfortable for me. You know what I'm saying? Because my, my parents were the pastor, right? My father ran the home, so it was like, me, I could kind of like get away with some stuff. Right? But it, when I was in the home of San Antonio, I was just a ordinary Joe. You know, I was just like everyone else. In fact, they're like, yeah, start from the bottom up. You got to start as a homeboy. 
during two weeks and under. You know, they, they, they had a program where like, if you're two weeks and under, you're in the front of the line, right? You get uh, you eat first, and there's like, you get all like, uh, uh, red carpet treatment, right? <laughs> don't worry about chores, don't worry about nothing, no. Just take it easy, and oh, all right, this is good, man. <laughs> I ain't complaining about this. But then all of a sudden, the ways begin to turn, right? Get more responsibility, and all of a sudden, you know, you know how to hold it. Get correction. Get discipline. Mm. Amen. My question for you is how to step out of the boat. Number one, you got to take a step of faith. You have to take a step of faith. The fact that Peter stepped out, right? That that whole picture is taking a step of faith. You know, he doesn't know what's going to happen. He didn't know if he was going to walk on water. He goes, if Jesus said to come, I'm going to go. Are you with me? And I want to go back somewhere in the Old Testament because taking a step of faith, you have to understand that in order for you to take a step of faith, you have to believe in God. Amen. You have to believe that God is the one telling you, come to me. Are you with me? Let's go, uh, you don't have to go there, but uh, and you can write it down. Joshua chapter 1, 2 to 3, 5 to 7 and 9. These are a few verses I want to share on because in order for us to take the step of faith, you have to believe what God tells us. The same thing he told Joshua, the same thing he told Moses, the same thing he told his other prophets, his other men and women that God used. Is the same thing God's having you and me today. And, and, and the screen says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Right? This is the message. You're going to rise up. You're going to take a step of faith into a new territory, to a land that you don't know about. You're going to go and take this land. You're going to take all the people. Hello? It's what God's calling you and I to do. We're going to rise. We're going to cross this Jordan. You're going to take a step of faith into your calling that God has called you to do. And this is a promise he says. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. Where do you go? It's yours. Are you with me? Look what it says. It says, and no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Look what it says. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. This is powerful. You know why this ministry, Joshua One Two Fellowship, has been standing here for over 30 years? It's because my father wasn't like, uh, I'm going to go here and, and do something for God. No. He listened to God. God says, go to St. Andrew. And he took a step of faith, right? He didn't know nobody here. We're from San Antonio. <laughs> right? That, that's my hometown. That, that, that's where he was born. My mom was born. That's where I, I was born. Right? He didn't know San Angelo even existed. But God called him. And God sent him here. It wasn't a man made ministry through the flesh. Those don't last long. Right? It's the same thing. It, 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 it's not going to last long. But if it was God that sent you, look what the Bible says. Said, he says, no man will be able to stand before you. What people will try to do, when people will try to close you down, when people try to shut you down, no, God says, I will back you up. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. Are you with me? 
He says, No man will be set before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. He says, I will not fail you or forsake you. That's powerful. Jesus, God says, I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to abandon you like some of your disciples do. I'm with you like your ex did. Abandon you, right? When your wife abandons you, God says, I will not abandon you. I'm not going to forsake you. And he says, be strong and courageous. For you shall give these people possession of the land, which I swore to their fathers to give them. And again, he says, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. Stay in line with the word of God. In other words, stay in line with what God has taught you. You got the principles. You, you've been trained. You've been discipled. You've been working. God has equipped you. Are you with me? If you want to have success, what you're doing has to be lined up with the word of God. If it's not... Whatever you try to do will not last on. He goes, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Three times. Where God says, be strong and courageous. And I'm with you. God says, I'm with you. He, he repeats himself because he knows you're, you're stubborn. You're, you're, you're where all it is, the Pancho Villa. Stubborn Mexicans. Amen. Hard-headed. So God has to repeat himself. I'm with you. Be strong. Be courageous. I'm with you. I'm not forsaking you. Be strong. Be courageous. I'm not going to fail you. I'm born with you. You're not alone. I'm with you. Be strong and courageous. So to take a step of faith, you have to believe that God is with you. Peter knew that God was with you. He knew Jesus was there with him. That's the only reason why he was able to take a step out of the boat. Why? Because he knew Jesus was there. Are you with me? To take how to take a step out of, of how to step out of the boat, number one, take a step of faith. Right? Number two, believe Jesus called you. Believe Jesus called you. Peter, he, he called Jesus. Jesus, if it's you, allow me to come to you. What did Jesus say? Come. What does that mean? Come. I said, hey, Austin, bring me a bottle of water. What is he doing? He's coming. He's calling. He's calling. And that's what Jesus said. Come. He's calling you. I am thirsty. Thank you. Scared. That's why I don't know how was. You come to him, Jesus. <laughs> you know, the Sabbath's all shaky. Are you with me? It's a calling. Jesus said, Come. Come here. Come on, buddy. Step out your boat. Come, on. come back to the home. Yeah. Come on. It's a calling. Oh, Not for me, but for Jesus. <laughs> Amen. The album comforts you. Amen. If you didn't know, this is for you. Amen. In John 15, 16, just write it down. 
Man, learn how to take notes. It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Jesus, I chose you and appointed you that you will go and bear fruit and that your fruit will remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. Amen. Jesus says, you didn't choose me. You didn't choose this life. I chose you for this life. But there's a movie called uh, Mark Up, right? And he's like, the suit did not choose me, right? I don't know how he said it. Is. But uh, I did not choose the suit, but the suit chose me. Right? And that's the same thing. We, we didn't, I didn't ask God to make me a pastor. No, none of the pastors that honor us don't want, do not want to be a pastor. Is that true or no, Pastor Fred right here? Right? Hell no. <laughs> I remember when I was like 14, 15 years old, and, and there was a pastor from uh, somewhere in Peru visiting. He's like, you're going to be a pastor one day. I was like, look, I respect you, but my mom like, mm-mm. Because I know what was at stake there. I'm like, no, I... I don't want that responsibility. But God, when God called me, He told me to do it. He appointed you. Hello? Jesus, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. And you will go. You will go and you will bear fruit. You're going to be used by God. And what you do will remain. You know, my, my father, he's not the perfect pastor, the perfect man. But the fruit that he has for the past 25 years, 30 years, still remains. Amen. They're not perfect, but it remains. Some have churches, some have families, some have pastors. They came through these doors. Some of y'all know him, Pastor Rob Brewster. Some of y'all know, uh, uh, some of y'all don't know. Y'all, y'all meet him in two weeks or three weeks. We have, we have a, uh, in December, we have some guests coming down. The first Sunday of, of, of December, we have a pastor, Rick Mendoza from Fort Worth. He'll be joining us to speak with us. On Saturday night, he'll be teaching the home. Y'all are welcome to join. But then on Sunday morning, he'll be here speaking. Then the following Sunday, we have another good friend of ours, Daniel uh, Arena. I uh, keep pronouncing his last name, man. But we call him Duke, right? He came to the home in 1995 or 94 at the age of 13 years old. He was paroled by a judge. A judge sent him to a home from New Mexico. You know, I know a place in Texas, 13 years old, Texas. <laughs> he got saved and, and now he's a pastor. And, and there's many more. Pastor Bobby McDonald. And even today, like, there's, there's, there's countless of men and women that are remaining. Are you with me? Yeah. Why? Because when God calls you and He chooses you, what you do for Him, what you do, it will remain. All you that come to the home, you're not, you, you will never be the same. You go home or you leave with daddy or wherever, but you you leave with something like stuck and you're like, oh, the hell you happened to me? What happened to me, man? Like, you're brainwashing or something. And you're right. The word of God washed your filthy brain. Amen. In 1 Peter 2 9 says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellence of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
God has called you to proclaim the goodness of God, that God is good to you, that God is great to you and for you. What what I preach and what we preach is what God has done for us, what we have experienced. Hello? Are you out there? Do I got to turn off the lights? Amen. There's a verse that you can put up there. Um, I was going to say it for the end, but uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 27, 28 is the last uh, uh, verse there. It says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And I look across this room and I see a lot of foolish people. A lot of imperfect people. Uh, a lot of people with a lot of mistakes and flaws. We're like the wild bone. We're like the worst. We're, we're the undrafted pigs. Are you with me? Undrafted. I mean, you weren't, you weren't worthy to be picked. Amen? It says that God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are. That's good to hear. It brings hope to me that, hey, okay, God, I'm not all that jacked up. <laughs> Man, I'm not the only one. Man. And, and, and I know I, I'm not perfect. And, uh, the the home the church in San Antonio, uh, he, the pastor always say this: the moment you walk into this door, we know, and I know you know you're not perfect. You have mistakes, man. Because if you walk if you walk in yours, you need a miracle, man. In other words, we're all jacked. And they had a slang uh, on their flyer, the perfect church for unperfect people. And no one's perfect. And God says, you know what? I know you're not perfect. You make a lot of foolish decisions. But I call you. I chose you. You belong to me. So that you can proclaim the goodness of God. And what you do for me will make an impact in this world. You know, stepping out of the boat, it will lead you into your destiny. While you stay in your comfort zone, it will hinder what God has in store for you. There's two men in the Bible They both had an opportunity. Two guys. They both had the equal same opportunity to step out of the boat. One did. One responded, like Peter. One out of twelve. All right. The story goes to uh, First Samuel twenty-six, and um. David, he finds himself on the run. King Saul is trying to kill him. And uh, he finds out that Saul, he's like on his tail, right? He's like like a hound dog, uh, sniffing him out. And so David's on the run. He's hiding with his men. And they find out, hey, hey, King Saul's nearby. And so David is about to do a suicide mission. He's about to sneak into the camp of the king. Right? And the Bible says he goes to take, he, he takes his, his spear and his jug of water to show him that he was very close to him. And that his men were, were slacking off because he, he sneaked into all into the middle of the camp. And the way they did it in the back in, in the old days, in, 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 in the Old Testament, is, is when the king was, was like traveling to war or whatever. He was, sleep, he was kept in the middle 
and, uh, and, and like, a, like a target, it was like a like a round that uh, the the from the uh, command right from the strongest one, it would go all the way out until he was like the So to get to him, he has to go to like the soldiers. And then the further you go, the stronger the soldiers are. Right, and that's how the camp was set up. And so David was like, "This is what I'm about to do." But well, I need one guy to go. With and and here's and we're going to read in First Samuel twenty six six. Then David said to two to, to the two guys, to Amalek the Hittites, and to Abishai the son of Zerubi, uh, Zer Zeruiah, Joab's brother, saying this, "Who will go down with?" You? me to Saul in the camp? It's a question. Who's going to go with me? Who wants to go with me? Who wants to step out of our comfort zone and go to Saul's camp? Abishai said, I will go down with you. I'm not going to say nothing. He was hoping that he was like, you go, man. Who wants to go out fundraising? You go, man. Right. Who wants to go? Well, when I was in the, in the home of San Antonio, we'll, we'll say things to get volunteers, right? He goes, once we use my guy, I'm going to be there. Y'all come up, help me out. We'll go get some tables and get some chairs, right? It's about being, okay, here you go, use Who wants to be used? And here's David, goes, hey, Y'all two, who wants to go? And ever size the algorithms. The sad thing is this. It, 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 it's not, you might not read this very like, nah, it's just a, a verse, right? But this is a very impactful time. It's about to impact two people. The sad thing is this, both had an opportunity. But only one responded. Amalek and Abishai both were called. But Amalek did not want to step out of his comfort zone. He didn't want to go like, oh, you're crazy, man. Like, he wanted to play it safe. He didn't want to go all in. And he missed his opportunity to do something for God. Well, Abishai, he stepped out of his comfort zone. And he went with David. And what happens is that his life changes. In fact, the Bible says that this man, Abishai, became one of David's mighty men. David had, he had like 37 uh, uh, soldiers that were like his top soldiers. Like, man, these were men that were uh, commanders. They were like, uh, like Rambos, dude. For real, they're like, they're bad to the bone, dude. One, one guy, one commander, he killed over 700 men by himself. When he was the Jesus soldier. One man, another man, he, he killed a lion in a pit in the winter with a spear. And cold, right? He's in picture in the winter and he have a, a, a pit and there's a lion there. He jumped down there and he killed the lion. Man, these men were like fear, they're like bad to the bone. And the fact that this man goes, Lord, I'll go with you. He was just he didn't know what was gonna happen. He was a soldier. But his his his, his, his response to David made an impact in his life. Where he became one of David's mighty men. And you know what happens is that in, 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 in uh, uh, 2 Samuel, we're going to read it later on, he's mentioning it. He, his name is Remember. In other words, he, he left a legacy. He did something where his family is remembered, his, and everything changed his whole life, and his whole family was changed. Where Emelech was never mentioned again. You will you not find his name ever again in the Bible. Why did he, he miss his opportunity to do something for God? 
In 2 Samuel 23, 18, it says, Now Abishai, the brother of Joram, the son of Zerah, was a chief of another three of mighty men. He lifted his spear against 300 men and killed them. And he won a name among these three. 19. Were he, was he not the most honored of three? Therefore he became their captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. David had three top warriors. But Abishai was like number four. He was good. He was a soldier. See, when, when, when God opens the door of opportunity for you, you need to take that step. Yeah. You might be scared. You might be like, I don't know if I can do it. But you need to be like, you know what? Okay, God, I'm going to get out of the boat. Are you with me? I don't know if you know that. that it's like getting out of the boat. Right. Is that a cowboy western? No. I want to share uh, some examples of men today who stepped out on faith. They stepped out of the boat and they left legacies. Pastor David Wilkinson was just a white hillbilly preacher and uh, God dealt with him one day to go, to go fast and pray and he did. And, and when he got out of that, he, he opened the newspaper, right? And the front page was five teenagers that uh, was going to court for murder, right? And, and he opened and, and he, he reads the story, and then the whisper tells him, you need to go pray for those five men. And you're like, okay, go. He, he's from Pennsylvania, so he goes to New York to pray for these five kids in court. He shows up to the court hearing, and they didn't even allow him to go inside the court. In fact, they didn't even allow him to go in and pray for the five team. And as he's like uh, walking around the streets of New York, man, I don't know nobody here, I got no money. He's like, and he's living in his car. He's like, God, you told me to pray for these five men I can't even pray for them. But as he begins to walk the streets, he begins to see not just those five, but more. Drug addicts, gang members, right? Prostitutes. And he's like, man, the guy says, these are the people he begin to reach. And then he, he opened up the first team talents in New York City. He's actually the founder. He's actually the founder of team talents. He's the one that establishes the first, like he established two towns. Right? Another man named Pastor uh, Sonny Arizona was a, he was one of the first heaven addicts that uh, uh, got saved. And God dealt with him, he needed to go back to California and, and, and reach out to the drug guys. He took a step of faith. Went back to California. Uh, Pastor Freddy Garcia was a heroin addict out of San Antonio. Strung out of heroin. And he was like trying to change his life and he thought if he moves to California, he will he'll get out of the drug scene and, and change it. He ends up five minutes fighting drugs there, right? And, and, and he ends up finding out that he had a friend from San Antonio that got saved and he invited to come to two towns. And he goes to the doors of two towns. And that's where Pastor Freddie gets saved. And then all of a sudden he goes, and then God tells him, man, you need to go back to San Antonio. There's, there's more drug guys that need to know about Jesus. He goes, okay, he, he went back to San Antonio. He began to uh, uh, just tell people about Jesus. No one responded for over a year. And God says, open your doors. Bring him into your home. Help him. And the impact took place. In 1979, a 
pastor had a church open. And my father went to that church. He got saved from heroin addiction. And then God called him. When God called him, he went to the home, go to the, uh, go to the academy. He, he goes. God says, now I want you to go to San Antonio. Okay. He picked up the faith. Right. Came to San Antonio, 1988. Mm-hmm. And for over 32 years, they reached out to the drug addicts. Right? I mentioned some men who came to the doors that, that are, are doing something for God. But today in our time, the, the first pastor that, that uh, uh, was was launched out from our branch was Pastor Danny Zapata. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember that man, he was like scared, like nervous, like, man, I, I just want to say it's an angel, man, like, I don't know, but, but he, he, he stepped out of the pool. Right? You, you're with Danny? Right? That's fruit. That remains. Because Danny, he wasn't, he got out of his comfort zone. And he's going to leave an impact, a legacy for his son. Pastor Victor, two kids, take a step out of faith. And he has a church, he's having a service right now. Are you with me? So while I'm saying that, there's opportunity for you to step out of the boat. God, use my life, do something, Lord. If you use these men that were like Danny and, and Victor Manning, he can certainly use you. <laughs> Think about it, if God can use Victor, like, <laughs> there's no limits of what God can do in your life. Amen. Yeah, some of y'all don't know who Victor is, but you know, he has a weird, you know, way of processing things, you know. Right? But this one, I want to conclude with. What was stopping you from stepping out the boat? It's fear of failure. Fear of failure. You, you feel, you have this fear, God, what about failure? What if I'm not good enough? What if I let you down? What, what if I, uh, 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 the fear of, of failing will keep you from stepping out of the boat? Well, understand this. God already knows you're going to fail him. That's not the concern. That, that's just an excuse that we have that keeps us from accomplishing. Let me share this. You know that when, when God told Adam, God tells Adam right in, in, in Genesis, he says he tells him, Adam, I'm gonna put you in this garden. You can take care of it. But there's one tree in the middle of the garden. You should not eat it. In the day you eat of it, you will surely die. I was I was sharing with the homeboys and homegirls that like I opened a little revelation to them. When God says in the day you eat of it, in other words, he was saying, you're going to eat of it one day. You're going to eat it one day. You're going to die. But then God says, later on, but I'm going to substitute two lambs for your sins. In other words, I, I'm seeking to help you to overcome your, your, your failure. God already knows you. You're going to fail God. I feel God all the time. I already feel God every day. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, mean, I mean, look at Martin. He feels God every day. Right? But we, we understand, though, that now, after all this, like, falling, tripping, and, yeah. and hurting ourselves, Telling God, and we understand, oh, it's not about me telling God. It's about me disobeying God. Just be obedient, okay, God. Step out the boat, okay. He steps out. 
Understand that Peter failed Jesus. Even when he was walking on the wall. Right? But he took the chance. Right? He took the chance. But God called him back. Remember this. You're not called by man. You're called by Jesus. Jesus, you're called by the pastor. They come and go to ministry and this run this and uh, uh, us, we can take the land. No, God said, I have called you. I called you. Any other pastor, they didn't call you. Joshua Convention didn't call you. House of Power didn't call you. No, no. God has called you. And he has appointed you. He, this, look what Jesus said. This, this is powerful. In John 14, 12, Jesus says, you believe in me. The work that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these, he will do. Because I go to the Lord. Jesus said, you will do greater things than he did while he was on earth. What does that mean? Jesus did great things. Right? He rose the dead. He healed the sick. He healed the crippled. He did a lot of great things. And Jesus said, if you believe what I did, you will do great. Peter and John were walking to the temple one day to praise God, to worship God. There was a crippled man, a beggar. He was begging for money. He got the quarter. He has some change. And they said, we didn't have nothing on us. We're broke. We're from the home. But what I do got is Jesus. Get up and walk. He like, start walking. The Bible, he began to jump with him and leap with him going to the temple of God. That was a miracle. And then Paul gets in, right? And, and, and the Bible says that Paul will get handkerchiefs. They will get handkerchiefs. Hey, Paul pray for the handkerchief. And they'll take them to the sick and they'll just put them on them and they get healed. The shadow of Peter will heal the sick. His shadow, that black thing. His shadow will heal people. They'll lay him in the street like that and he'll just walk and. They hit the shower with his son and they hit. Do greater things. I pray for drug addicts. They were kicking. They get healed. <clears throat> God still heals people today. Yeah. From all diseases. This whole post is, is a testimony of one. And some of y'all are testimony so. Really? God still does If you want to see a great man, and you want to explain it to me, show me the scientific facts how that happened. There, there's a, on Facebook, there's a picture where, um, when Jesus uh, fed over 5,000 people with fish and bread, right? and, and they're making fun of like today's generation. Well, uh, is a fish? Is it um, natural? Is it they have toilet? Right? They're like, you're not asking kind of just accept the miracle. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, dude. Don't make it complicated, man. <laughs> Are you with me? Understand this. The only thing that'll stop you from stepping out the boat is yourself. Faith. Well, I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. He says he chooses the foolish things of the world. We're not good enough. We're not qualified. But God says, I will qualify you. Because I will be with you. I will go with you. I am with you. Be strong, be courageous. 
I'm your God. I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to let you down. You have to believe what he says. Amen? Stand with me.